Welcome to The Rebel Rebel. It's a podcast for creative rebels and entrepreneurs. I'm your host, Michael Dargy. In every episode, we look for truly unique and interesting guests who have said, often literally, f*** it to the status quo and have just gone on their own way. One thing's for sure is that it's never easy, it's always challenging, and these rebels wouldn't have it any other way. Look for the links to everything we talk about in the show notes on our website at therebelrebelpodcast.com. Welcome to the Rebel Rebel Podcast. I'm Michael Dargy, and sitting across from me at Sea Space Studio is none other than Dr. Larry Stanley. <laughs> How's it going, Larry? It's going great. <laughs> Pretty excited to be here. Yeah, oh, I'm so happy that you're here. Yeah, this is great. Um, so, just to, I want to get a couple things out right away. Okay, called you Doctor. Yeah, um, but. And is that like, if that's not enough, you are more than just a doctor. You are a writer. You're a comedian. You're a speaker. You're a voice actor. You do so many things. You're also a philanthropist. You are a kick-ass human. How do we unpack this in one show? Um, let's make it a TV series. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. <Talk to> Larry. <laughs> um, uh, I like eclectic things and uh my life reflects that as well uh, when you see my record collection uh, you name the musical genre and i've got lots of it wow. my favorite thing to do when listening to music is to have it on shuffle apple's got 60 million songs they said if they if i could have on apple music yeah. 60 million songs on shuffle and not know what's coming up next i would subscribe to it otherwise i'm just using my music library wow yeah that's but, outstanding. Yeah, that's the kind of guy I am. And but same thing with books and and uh, and and uh, movies. Uh, you name it, uh, I I watch it, I listen to it, I read it. It's uh, it's eclectic because it, it's all interesting. I love it. Like your shirt is interesting. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> we, well, I, we'll have to do like we'll do like a selfie. Uh, at the end here where I can, you know, show that off to the listeners. Done. Because it's outstanding. Tommy Bahama. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So I, I, I tell you what, like part of this show is figuring out where people came from. Yeah. Uh, what they're doing now, where they're headed. And then, of course, uh, you know, advice at the end. But you were actually a rock and roll radio DJ. Out yes, of East, I right? was. Yes, I was. So. Music runs through my soul. Um, I'm the second youngest of 13. What? Yeah. Born and raised in uh, the Toronto area. Um, my mother, what? who's one of eight, uh, was um, her oldest brother was Percy Faith. Percy Faith uh, is a Canadian uh, musician, composer, arranger who is the most prolific recording artist in North American history. He has wow. over 60 albums recorded. Oh my God. But he died in 1976. So a lot of people today don't know who he is or was, but uh, uh, just a terrific guy and a great musician. And so music runs through our, our, our veins. And I played uh, piano, clarinet, saxophone. I was in a jazz band. Uh, I got my grade 10 in, um, in the Royal Conservatory for first class honors. So music was really great. And then when wow. I started university, they had a radio station there at U of, U of T. And uh, I thought, boy, it'd be fun to, to do that. And this was at the time when uh, in the radio station, you got to spin your own records. Like wow. you, you got to decide yeah. what was on the playlist. And so I had total <laughs> freedom and it was great. I did it for four years and it was just a blast. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. And people said I had a voice for radio. I think I've got a face for radio too, but that's <laughs> I don't know. okay. You're a handsome man, <laughs> sir. Oh, my wife would say that too, but thank you. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So do you like looking back? Uh, so, I mean, that's a while ago mm -hmm. and you know, you spent four years there going to school, doing the stuff, you know, fast forward to today and you're a dentist. Yes. And, um, and you, you do have some specialties, but, it's this other stuff, how you got to add this. I mean, you've got like a, uh, oh my goodness, ugh, the words are failing me. Uh, not a comic, a, come on, that word, uh, blah, book. It's a book. <laughs> the United States of North America. Yeah, graphic novel. Graphic novel. Yes. Thank you. Oh my God. I'm going to leave all that in because okay. that's just so awkward. <laughs> uh, there's a story there too. I know. And I can't, I can't wait to, to hear it. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I'm fascinated with, you know, from those beginnings. I mean, obviously, family of 13, 
oh man, yes, that's incredible. That's got to be a story in and of itself. Um, you know, to the uh, music and how you got into dentistry, and then why speaking and comedy. How do we get there? So help me. Okay. Well, um, I'll 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 go back to yeah. to Toronto. I mean, I was very lucky. Second youngest of thirteen, and my parents, uh, they were born in the in the nineteen 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 twenty. So they're really old school uh, kinds of people, and uh, they had my me and my younger sister later in their lives, and so I grew up in a household with a lot of people. So I had lots right. of attention as a kid. And then sure. when I became a teenager, wanted my own space, they'd all grown up and moved out. So I had the best <laughs> of all worlds. Wow. And, and, and by that time, my father was doing well. And and so, you know, we were comfortable. We got to do things uh, that my older siblings didn't have the opportunities. And then uh, I, um, uh, my family are as eclectic and different and fiercely independent as I am. And I'm the only one in my whole family who's, who's in healthcare. None of them are in healthcare. We've got an accountant and a lawyer. We've got the one guy was in jewelry. Uh, my brother's a writer. Uh, I've got another brother uh, who's um, a uh, management consultant and he travels all over the world mm. doing that. Um, I, my younger sister's a, a, a serial entrepreneur. Uh, so there's a, you know, one sister was in, in uh, environmental uh, st- studies. So really eclectic uh, group of people. Yeah. Uh, all very creative in their own rights. And, and, um, uh, but I did well in school. Um, and I'm the only one in my family who graduated high school with, uh, uh as an Ontario scholar, which at the time, uh, meant that every subject you had 80% or higher. Wow. And, uh, I had this dream since I was a kid to be in the medical field huh. and I finished high school and then my father died suddenly. Oh. And uh, he left behind a debt where we lost everything after he died. Three months later, we lost our house. We lost our cars. Oh, my gosh. Uh, it was tough, but uh, yeah. I was going to quit and, and uh, try and uh, help uh, support my mom, who had to go back to work after not working for 40 years. Wow. Uh, but my family convinced me to stay in school. Like They knew I had this dream, and, and I had to stay in school to achieve it. And so I did. And, and the Ontario government at the time had very um, generous programs for uh, um, supporting students with grants and and, uh, scholarships and stuff like that. So it got me through my first degree, but because I was challenged with supporting myself and going to school and and all the other things, my marks weren't there in my first couple of years. And so I didn't get in. And uh, so I decided to stay in school. I knew if I got out and started working, I wouldn't be able to go back to school. So I went and did a master's in research in cystic fibrosis. And uh, (laughs) uh, I got a research, um, a Canada research uh, fellowship. um, And uh, that that scholarship uh, is what actually got me into everything after that. So I did research in cystic fibrosis and I learned how much I like uh, reading about research and I like talking about research and how much I hate doing it. So uh, so I knew that an act. Academic career was not for me, uh-huh. um, but after not getting into anything, I got I applied to dentistry, I applied to medicine, I applied to teachers' college, and then I got into everything. Really? And now I had to choose. Oh my gosh! So I'm sitting at home and I'm watching the season-ending episode of Saint Elsewhere, a medical drama that takes yeah. place in the fictional hospital in Boston, yeah. and <laughs> Howie Mandel, the Canadian comic, was one of the actors in that show, and he had a serious role, and he was one of the interns and. Near the end of that first season, one of the interns had taken their life and they're all sitting around in the last episode and they're sort of uh, reminiscing and and, uh, memorializing their fallen comrade. And and one of them said, you know, a whole year of our lives just went by and all we did was eat and sleep and work. And that was when my light bulb went off because at this point I'd completed a master's, I'd completed a bachelor's, I'd been a rock reality DJ, I was in music, I I was in bands, I was uh, I was the entertainment editor of a newspaper. Um, I knew that I didn't want a year of my life to go by, and all I did was eat and sleep and work. So I chose yeah. dentistry, and I have never regretted it. It was a great choice really? for me. Yeah. Yeah. So dentistry fulfills all the things that I want. I get to be my own boss. I yeah. can choose my hours. I earn a comfortable income. Um, uh, I, um, 
it, it, it just, it, I get to be a marketer. I get to, to enhance relationships. I, it's wow. just, you name it. I get to do it. I have to stay in school. I've I'm constantly going to, to school. The Alberta Dental Association requires us to have 60 hours of continuing education lectures per year, uh, per two years. Wow. And I average about a hundred hours per year. So wow. I just, I like school. It's just, it, 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 it uh, I love learning. I love growing. Yeah. You, you know, when it comes to life and in business, uh, but life in general, General, you're either growing or you're shrinking. Yeah. You're never the same. Fair enough. And and so if you're not growing, um, then you need to get out of whatever you're doing. And one of my mentors a long time ago said, Larry, you should spend 10% of your time outside your envelope of comfort. If you do that, then you'll always grow. You'll always enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. If you go more than 10%, you're going to get uh, into trouble. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to get into trouble. You're going to, you, something's going to go wrong. Yeah. If you do less than 10%, then you're going to stagnate. You're going to hate what you do and you're going to f- try and find to do something different. Yeah. And so that's where I've been with regards to what I'm doing here. I've been a dentist now for 33 years. I still love what I do. Wow. I'm not going to change. I'm going to continue working in the field that I'm working. So I, um, I'm in Toronto. I'm in dentistry. Um, the curriculum is tough. Uh, you have to work hard to, to do well. And I couldn't work full time. I couldn't work part time and support myself and go to school. So I joined the Canadian forces. What? Yes. Yes. And, and, um, and, uh, it was, a fabulous decision for me um i'm a member of the jewish faith and a jew in the canadian forces is a very rare thing indeed but uh and rare for my family as well but it was a good experience and uh i got to serve our country for six years and that's how i ended up in calgary from toronto when i finished school they said you're going to calgary and uh and it was it was great i i've uh i learned a lot about our country about our history yeah i um i've traveled across our country uh, multiple times as a result of being in the forces. So I've seen our great nation. Yeah. Uh, it was a tremendous experience. Um, I even got to serve as a member of a NATO force in North Norway, 600, wow. uh, 200 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Oh we left Calgary, it was minus 27 and landed in uh, Tromso in North Norway. Yeah, it was plus five and raining. <laughs> it's, just, it's the north end of the Gulf Stream. And so their, their waterway there is ice free all year round. And uh, they got a Navy up there and a university up there. And wow. it was, yeah, the Norwegian people were outstanding. Yeah. Uh, they really were they really were great. Oh, that's fun. And uh, so when I meet people from Norway and they and I tell them I've been to Tromso, they they say I've never been to Tromso, but but yeah, and it's it's kind of cool. It's 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 far away. You can't get to Tromso in the winter time yeah. except by boat or by air, I should say. Yeah, wow. You just you, you can't go by land. It's just there's no way to get there by land. It's just too much snow and ice. But uh, it's uh, it's a neat place if you have a chance to go. Go in the winter, the aurora borealis is out of this oh, world. I can imagine. And in the summer, it's sunny 23 hours a day. Does that drive you nuts? Like how- I, I was only there in the winter time. Oh, okay. So, so you're just we like- had maybe four hours of sunlight. Wow. Yeah. So uh, it, 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 it was it was dark most of the time, but yeah. the people were great. Man, That's it was awesome. a good, it was a quite an experience. So. I only have good memories and, That's good. and, uh, and away we go. So uh, my contract ended with the forces. And at the time they had more dentists in the King forces than they needed. And so they offered me a financial incentive to get out. What? And so I did. Um, if I wanted to get that financial incentive, I would have had to stay another 14 years. And I liked my time in the forces, but I didn't see 14 more years in the forces. Yeah. I saw maybe five, wow. but I got out and I, and I liked Calgary so well. I thought I saw a future for myself here and, uh, oh, it's great. and I, did and and I and I and here I am ever since and you know the movie Up yeah um, and and they have those dog characters where you have squirrel and moose <laughs> yeah. and that's me you know and and so every time I come across things that are, look interesting my attention is has gone off in that direction and, uh, and then I try and find a way to have some time to devote to it so I, I have a, an affinity towards uh, polymaths so like a, a Renaissance people. yes. 
Uh, and it sounds like, you know, and everything I know about you, which admittedly is not, I didn't know about the military. I, there's yeah. so much I didn't know. <laughs> you are a deep well, sir. <laughs> um, Thank you. But I, I just find it fascinating that you like, I understand that you see something, you're just like, I need to take it apart and figure it out and, you know, see how it connects to my other parts. Well, I love that. I um, so here I am now. It's the 90s. And I'm, I've, uh, I worked for another dentist for a little while and realized that being the fierce independent person that I am, like the rest of my family, I needed to be my own boss and needed yeah. to have my own place. And so I bought a practice from a guy who retired. His name was Roy Rasmussen, a great dentist. Um, and he'd practiced for 44 years. He bought his practice on Friday the 13th <laughs> and he sold it to me on Friday the 13th, 44 <laughs> years later. Oh my it was, God. It was great. It was great. I ended up being the fifth dentist in a line of dentists who had owned that practice. It had moved about three or four times. And, and, um, but a couple of years in, I'm, I'm running my practice and I'm doing okay, but I'm not moving forward. So I'm not paying down debt the way I wanted to. And, and things are, and a good friend of mine who is a um, business coach and, 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 uh, and stuff was having dinner at my house it was boxing day. And he told me that we need, I needed to work better on communication skills, which can lead to sales strategies and a whole bunch of other stuff. And I ended right. up hiring him and, and, and I learned how important relationships were in the success of business right. and uh and i you, you people you intuitively know it but how do you apply it and so that's what he brought in he, he right. taught us how to how to apply it how you can assess people pretty quickly yeah. and and how you can customize what you say to people so you can enhance the relationship because if they if you build a relationship then it becomes personal instead of professional right and that builds trust because when in health in healthcare you have to trust the person you're dealing with and yeah. and we see doctors when we are not well but we see dentists regularly to keep us well. Yeah. And so from a preventive side, I see people regularly for years. And now I've there are people I've been seeing and treating for over 30 years. They're friends, they're family now to me. Uh, I get invited to their children's uh, weddings. Uh, <laughs> um, I get, uh, I've attended funerals. I've I've uh, been part of life cycle events of wow. these people. I've uh, I've attended art openings or or other things if they're creative. And 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 it's the relationships that have driven all that I do. Um, you take care of people and the money comes. Right. You know. It's yeah. so it's not about the money. It's about the people. And and that's where my focus has always been. And and and. and and it's and it's very cool, and um, and because of my um, I've now forgotten the point where I was going with that, but that's okay. But because of my uh, my thing about about um, relationships and business and in and that and my radio DJ stuff, and I've always been interested in humor, um, yeah. uh, writing and stuff like that. That I had an opportunity to participate in a. Um, in in a in a humorous presentation, sort of stand up type comedy, uh, as a part of a fundraiser for a local uh, local community, and uh, and that went over really well. Oh, and, good. and I really liked um, uh, Saturday Night Live uh, when they used to do the comedy newscasts, and they would come up with stuff <laughs> that was really funny. And and I'm a big fan of George Carlin, and, and oh, he yeah. had some very funny newscasts. So I kind of emulated them and, and and updated some <laughs> of what they were doing, and it was it was fun. It was funny. It was it's. It's great to be up in front of people and 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 to make them laugh. Yeah, and uh, and it's no so no better feeling. It's no better <laughs> feeling. And because I was pretty good at being somewhat spontaneous, I'm not great at improv, but somewhat spontaneous. They, I started getting asked to do MC work for events. Nice. And um, uh, so I've done a fair bit of it as uh, for charitable um, um, stuff mostly. Yeah. Uh, I was just the MC for an online fundraiser for the Jewish Family Service Calgary honoring Sam Switzer oh. um, and uh, and that was ooh, almost two hours in length and it, w it went over really well they raised over four hundred thousand dollars wow. for that event and uh, it was it was great it was a lot of fun and oh, and good. people were amazed that I could spend two hours looking at um, uh, talking to no one in particular because I knew <laughs> there were people on the other end but I couldn't see anybody I was in a room all alone and yeah. and uh, but it was uh, it was fun and 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 uh, I was prepared and and uh, and we did it and, and, and away we go. And uh, you were asking earlier about 
the graphic novel. Yeah. Um, so my brother Alan in Vancouver is a writer. And uh, he writes mostly screenplays, television and movies. Uh, yeah. um, hasn't sold a lot of them. Um, I think he's very talented. And he wrote one in the 1988 called the United States of North America, USNA. Wow, and that's ahead of its time. Yes. And the premise is imagine a time in the near future when the U.S. does a corporate takeover of Canada. So they don't <laughs> yeah. they don't invade us. Yeah. There's lots of invasion stuff. That's not going to happen. Yeah. They buy us out. Yeah. They give each Canadian a million dollars person. And we said, OK, we'll become part of the United States of North America. And they rearrange 50 states and 11 provinces into five regions. And at first it's going well because we've got a lot of cash in our pockets. But then they draft our young people to fight drug wars in Central America. And they take away the family farms, create corporate farms manned by prisoners. And the Canadians said, hang on a minute. This is not what we bargained for. And so the book, let me rephrase that, the screenplay... Uh, the movie idea they had was about a Canadian rebel group led by a former prime minister trying to take our country back. Wow. Yeah. And so it ends up being a, uh, a, um, a chase uh, across Canada from, from Toronto to Calgary. They've got characters that <sighs> represent, you know, there's a, there's a, um, a Newfie, there's a, there's a Quebecois, there's a cowboy, there's a, there's a, an in- indigenous Canadian member. There's a, there's some Mennonite farmers. There's like, oh. there's a whole bunch of different characters that are, True, uh, true Canadian, uh, <coughs> recognizable Canadian type uh, stereotypes, and yeah. and um, God, I love the, it. the main character is a female uh, lawyer, um, and uh, it was a great story, and it got optioned three times. Um, two American producers, one Canadian. The Americans both said, oh, it's too Canadian. We can't sell it. Yeah. Uh, and the Canadian producer at the time in the 90s said, uh, too many locations we can't afford to shoot at. And it's kind of lay on the shelf. And then The Watchmen and Sin City and other graphic novels were converted successfully into movies. Yeah. And uh, The Walking Dead, this, yeah. the, the biggest selling graphic novel of all time, turned into this amazing television series. And so I said out to my brother, I said, what if we took this screenplay and made it into a graphic novel and, yeah. and sold it and maybe we can get interest from people? And so that's what we did. And that's when I got involved involved because um, I'm not the writer, but I came up with the cash to to find and, and hire a, an artist. And the Art and looks we, great, by the way. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, we hired Dave Casey, uh, a Calgary artist who's since moved to New York. And uh, he did a great job. It took a lot longer to do 220 pages of original art than we thought. Oh, yeah. um, but he did an amazing job and we, we uh, published it. We couldn't find a publisher who wanted to take it on. So we self published really? and then we started attending comic expos across the nation and sold them. Yeah. And we sold thousands of copies. Awesome. The, uh, the, uh, the people at the comic expos thought it was a great concept and, uh, and uh, they said, what happens next? And so my, the brother and his writing team went back and created a sequel cleverly titled USNA two. And now <laughs> the rebellion has spread throughout North America, Chicago, New Mexico, San Francisco, Halifax. So it's become North America wide with the idea being, if we can get someone interested, yeah. maybe we can s- s- create um, a TV, uh, a movie out of the first one and a television yeah. series out of the second one. And so we published the second one. It's two has sold very well. And, and that's sort of where we've left it. I've, I've, um, I've uh, kind of exhausted all my finances for that and uh, and <laughs> and I can't invest more money in it but we're uh, we're hoping that it'll gain some traction we've had yeah. lots of tire kickers lots of people showing interest in it but nobody has come forward with the dollars yet right. um, and uh, <clears throat> wanting to do that I'm hoping that something will happen soon Netflix has just said they're they've got um, um, nine figures that they want to invest in Canadian productions yeah. and uh, and they're looking for Vancouver based writers which is what my brother is mm. but they need a production company who is willing to put it forward and we're yeah. trying we're having trouble getting a Canadian production company interested in in uh, taking on the project it's but it's such a big unwieldy beast it is. and you know in what limited you know time i've spent trying to farm stuff like that out for um television or movies especially with netflix you have to you don't get paid a lot like netflix doesn't option it for a lot right right like so all the upfront cost is yours to carry you know you've got to figure it out they become a distribution and sometimes they're just the loan distribution yes 
you know, so that's a whole other animal to, I can't even wrap my head around, you know, other people are good at film business. But man. Yeah, it's I, I'm I'm a dentist but, and, and, <laughs> and, and stuff, but it's been fun getting involved. I've learned a lot about uh, publishing and about yeah. graphic novels and and, uh, and cool. the comic expos and, yeah. and that whole uh, community of people, which is phenomenal. Yes. What, a, what a welcoming, um, positive uh, group of people, the, the, the people who are not only the fans, but the people who work the comic expos. It's yeah. just, it's a, it's an amazing group. And I, I've been really privileged to have been part of that for the last decade. And that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Really I'd say the one thing that I just love hearing is that it's Canadian. Uh, because for the longest time, and I was working with a writer that was, he wanted everything to be based in America. And I'm like, fuck that. Canada's awesome. Like we need to have actually, you know, some stuff that's ours. Like I want to see Calgary. I want to see, you know, small town Saskatchewan. I, like I want to see all these things as part of our fabric. So right. hearing that there's something out there uh, that we can go enjoy that, you know, celebrates Canada that way. I just I'm inspired by it. Yeah. So usna.ca is the website. And if, if those who are interested in checking yeah. it out, but it's, um, it's been a fun ride and, and he's got other projects. There's another, uh, um, screenplay that he and his writing partners have, have hired a different artist that they're, uh, they're converting into a graphic novel called caretakers. It's a, oh. it's a ghost story, uh, fun. meant for a younger audience and stuff. And, oh, that's yeah, it's cool. just, uh, there's a lot of fun stuff. And, uh, I, every time I spend time with my brother, we we laugh a lot it's a lot of fun <laughs> so uh you know just to backtrack a little bit your brother also there's a podcast that you're a recurring character on which is um the pants optional yes yeah, so alan <laughs> um uh alan is as goofy and off the wall as i am and he created this uh podcast he calls no shirt no shoes pants optional <laughs> And uh, it's a podcast series that doesn't care if you're wearing pants or not. Perfect. Uh, and uh, we're not wearing is, pants right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm so glad that this is not um, on video because uh, <laughs> it's just this uh, Tommy Bahama shirt. And that's about <laughs> that's it. it. So, Tommy Bahama and a smile. <laughs> and, and commando. So, uh, but I um, <laughs> but the, so Alan asked if I would be a recurring character and I'm Dr. Larry, the medical correspondent. And oh. um, he, Many years ago, he created this character called the Guru Shev Impala, born in 1671, and <laughs> the the uh, stream of traffic consciousness, and how we can use traffic as a way of uh, wow. cleansing our souls, and and um, it's it's <laughs> it's totally again off the wall and and fun, and so I'm I'm apparently a disciple of the Guru Shev Impala, wow. and, and 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 so I do these goofy incantations and 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 give you some really strange instructions and and uh, on on how you can make your life better. It's just it's silly. It's fun. Yeah. Um, uh, there are parts where you wonder what the heck they're doing, and there are other parts when you just laugh out loud. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, it's it's been fun. It, you know, no one. It's all done. Uh, no one got paid for it. We haven't earned any money from it. It's just done for the sheer love of creating comedy. Love it. And uh, and so it's uh, it's been a fun ride. Uh -huh. He's taking a short hiatus from that because it's a lot of work. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I love your socks, by the way. Oh, thanks. Thanks. It's um. Life's too short not to wear fun socks. So uh, that sounds like one of my guests, which was the Friday Sock Company. Oh yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, they were a sponsor for a while, weren't they? They were. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Until COVID. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. We stopped wearing socks after COVID that's happened, right. and yeah. so you gotta stay so. safe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, Friday Sock Company still really good friends, um, and love them to death, and they've got the best socks because they're. Each one is different. Yes. Yeah, I like it. That well, you know, my my daughter Isabel is uh, uh, around the age of four or five, maybe younger. No, around the age of four or five when she started choosing her own clothes, chose to wear different socks, and she has never worn two same the same socks uh, on her feet at I, the same time ever since. She's so, amazing. Yeah, she is amazing. <laughs> she's she is. Um, 
she is a person who I think could do improv comedy. I'm trying to get her to, to go into it, but she hasn't yet. She is. How old is she now? She, she's 24. Yeah. She's spontaneously funny. She's uh, she's an incredible talent. Uh, she does all these different accents, and <laughs> she's just wickedly uh, her wit is is spot on yeah. uh, whereas my daughter Samara she's 19 um, she wants to get into film and TV production she's a great leader yeah. she's good at sort of seeing a big picture and figuring out where all the pieces go and directing nice. people into doing this and that and she uh, directed a one act play uh, for a festival in her last year in high school one best director because it was so good she oh, took um, good for her Vern uh, Thiessen's uh, one act plays Bluebirds, which was uh, um, uh, done out. He did a one of, uh, about Vimy, uh, First World War. Yeah. And then he did a one act play as a uh, sequelae to that uh, follow up uh, about three nurses, three Canadian women wow. who uh, who were in the First World War as well. And and uh, Samira asked permission to direct it for her high school project. And the teacher liked it so much, they entered it into a one act festival. Wow. And, uh, she won best director and uh oh my God. yeah she's got um a ton of talent and uh uh it's just very different than than isabel yeah. and uh pretty proud of both of them they're um they're neat people to hang out so they're covid they're both at home you know 50 uh, percent unemployment for people under the age of 25 right now tough. and so they're not working and i'm grateful for the generosity of uh of our federal government a lot of people like to slam the federal government and, and trudeau at every opportunity but yeah. the people who are at the low end uh, of income have managed to survive yeah uh, you know they're not they're not you know going on fancy vacations and stuff, but they're also not worrying about where their next meal is coming from because of this. And yeah, so I'm, good. I'm grateful for that. And, and, um, and, and I'm, I also love having them around cause they're, they're a lot of fun to be with. So, <laughs> that's awesome. so, so yeah, it's, it's pretty great. Oh, that's good. What, um, so what is sort of next on the, you know, either the, the Larry Stanley or the Dr. Larry, you know, you've got uh, Dr. Larry speaks, you've got, um, you know, your practice, obviously, what's sort of next for you? What's your next big, what's your next big thing? Well, there's two or two or three things. One, uh, which isn't really my next big thing, but it's a, it's a thing that I want to continue to support it. I wanted to mention it now is, is my involvement with the Loose Moose Theater. I love the Loose Um, Dennis Cahill, who you uh, interviewed earlier this year, the first one of, of this season, mm-hmm. um, is sort of in charge of that place. But they, 10 years, 10, 11 years ago, I attended the high school improv comedy championship that Loose Moose put on. Right. Yeah. The theater sports. Theater sports. Yeah. And, uh, and I was there for the finals and they had four teams from two high schools. And the uh, I, I don't remember who was the host, uh, whether whether it was you or whether it was Dennis or somebody else. But they came on and said, these these teams are going to compete for this no name trophy. And <laughs> and and I had an absolute blast listening to this. I didn't even know it existed. And at the end, I, I, I went up and I asked, I said, what would it cost to to support this and allow me to have the opportunity to name the trophy? And they came up with a number. And I said, I'm in and I'll even do more (laughs) if you'll allow me to name it. And you have to name it the Stanley Cup. Well, they thought it was the funniest thing they'd heard. And and I've been sponsoring it ever since. And and now it's grown from two teams and four teams and two high schools to this year. They had 13 high schools involved. And it's really grown. It's phenomenal. Um, it's, it went from uh, a competition over two nights to now over five nights. Yeah. And I'm very proud of how it's grown because being able to think quickly in a stressful situation to embrace the opportunity that you might fail doing this and, and that be okay, yeah. that's a life skill. Yeah. That's It's not about comedy and it's not about theater. It's done in a comedy and theater environment, but that's a life skill. And I wanted to support it and I've been proud to be supporting it ever since and will continue as long as I'm healthy and well and able to for the next 20 years. My long-term goal is that it become bigger than the other Stanley Cup that everyone <laughs> yes. seems to know about. Yeah, that's my goal. And Absolutely. and so that's one of the, the things that, that uh, is my long-term vision. But I, um, I, I took my successful dental practice and uh, 
fell into the area of oral facial pain and TMJ jaw dysfunction from trauma. And um, I was I was learning stuff about it. And I learned that if we work with a team of people and uh, chiropractors, physiotherapists, massage therapists, acupuncturists, uh, psychologists, um, we can help people who have had soft tissue injuries get better because wow. it's hard to diagnose and it's hard to treat. Right. And I was pretty good at it. And uh, that aspect of my practice exploded. Uh, the, my um, referral sources are other lawyers, uh, personal injury lawyers, uh, insurance companies, uh, WCB, the police, yeah. uh, not other dentists and stuff like that. Uh, now, because I've been doing it for 17 years, I've tr- seen and examined over 4,000 people. Um, wow. uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks about, you know, 10,000 hours and, yeah. and stuff, which he adapted from somebody else whose name escapes me right now. Um, so I've done that. I've done the more, more than 10,000 hours. So I'm somewhat of, a, of, of have some expertise in that field, right. uh, without necessarily the formal degree in there. Um, and I was doing that and I was running my full-time general practice and working 60, 70 hours a week and it's yeah. not sustainable. So I sold my general practice and now I've I've kind of refocused. I've joined uh, Jan Jaffer and the, the Trek Dental Group in Wildwood and, and uh, um, I'm there uh, clinically three days a week and 20% of what I do is still general practice dentistry. I still yeah. see all the people that I've known and cared for and, and grown to love over these years. And I work with two amazing other general dentists and they do just general dentistry, but I, my oral facial pain practice is the rest. And, oh, wow. and I'm doing all of this, but I've always had at my heart, the love of performing, getting up in front of a crowd and yeah. doing stuff. And, and I was at a lecture about four or five years ago by a guy named Paul Homily, who's a dentist who had a um, uh, um, disability with his eye, had to give up dentistry and now speaks and trains and coaches and mentors. And, and he was in Calgary and he was teaching about the concept of becoming a speaker. Uh-huh. And you know the saying, when the uh, student is ready, the teacher appears. And I didn't know I was ready, <laughs> but I was so ready to hear that. I, like I was thinking, wow, wow yeah, that's what I want to do. Yeah. Because in the mid-1990s, I went to the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry's convention in Boston. And I had never been to a big convention before. Um, this place had uh, about 5,000 people attending and what they did, and I, I've learned it's a commonplace now at, at a lot of conventions and conferences is they brought in a keynote speaker to start the day. Right. And then you broke off and you went to your lectures and, yep. and stuff like that. And so I'm in this big auditorium, there's 5,000 people there. And the first speaker they brought out, they dimmed, they, they cut all the lights and a spotlight went on the stage. And in came this guy in a wheelchair, quadriplegic. And he wheeled up and he plopped it right in the middle. And just with the power of his voice, had us totally captivated for an hour. Wow. His name's W. Mitchell. And he first was badly injured in a motorcycle accident. Recovered from that, he was a paraplegic. And then he learned to fly. And then his plane crashed. Oh, God. And burns. And, and now he's he's a, he's a quadriplegic. And, like, it was just an improbable story, an incredible story of resilience yeah. and recovery and overcoming obstacles. Wow. And at the end of that hour, the lights came up and standing ovation, obviously. And I was sitting there and I thought, Wow. That was amazing. I would love to be able to do that one day. Yeah. But then kind of parked it because I had this practice to build and and a f- young family and, and yeah. stuff like that to support. And, and now, 20 years later, I'm ready. And so I wanted to speak. So then came, what do I speak about? Right. What do I talk about? Well, I didn't want to talk about clinical dentistry. There's lots of academics out there talking clinical dentistry. And I hear so many other dentists criticize the person talking. And I said, you know what? I just don't want to go there. I don't want to be uh, up in front of people and have a segment of them always criticizing. I want to get up. I want to entertain. I want to motivate. I want to, I want to empower people. I want to, t- I want to make it positive. So I keyed in on the success is all about relationships. 
Because it really is. Um, uh, relationships drive everything that we do. Uh, if you develop a relationship with a person in front of you, then you you don't. If 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 you've got a business with them, you you don't have to sell them any longer. So yeah. relationships take away the quality of the relationships take away the need for sales. Yeah. And uh, I, it was uh, it was true in healthcare, and it's true in small business. So I realized that I want to talk about that, and I want to do it in such a way that. I won't be restricted to just talking to other dentists and dental teams. Yeah. So that's where I am now. And that's where I'm going in the future. Um, but my primary income is still from dentistry, uh, oral yeah. facial pain, uh, the consulting business that I'm doing, general practice dentistry. And it, it won't be until I'm earning more money speaking than I am doing anything else before I make that transition. But from yeah. the speaking will come books to support it. and. Yeah. I've got some other book ideas. I've got some children's book uh, concepts that I, I've uh, I've I've got a, a, a series. I've got the first two books written. I just have to put it together, get the artwork, and get it published. But time is my biggest commodity, and so yeah. I don't have time for that. And Alan and I have talked about writing a, a comedy uh, business book. Uh, um, it's about uh, customer stories, uh, customer service stories that are so fantastic they're unbelievable yeah. because they're all made up, really. <laughs> but um, but it was uh, it was. So I modeled after after uh, Jerry Steinfeld did a book about writing uh, letters to uh, to to companies of uh, and just the, the the letters are just totally off the wall silly yeah. weird like I can't believe you wrote these letters and um, and he did it under a pseudonym I've forgotten who the name that he used but <laughs> I, I just thought it'd be funny to write a business book that was just totally tongue in cheek comedy but yeah. the stories could sound like they could almost be real. And, yeah, yeah, maybe so, we learn a little something along the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, you know, lots of ideas, lots of stuff. I, I, I may even resurrect doing some stand-up comedy. I've got um, there's a charitable uh, thing that they do every year in February, and and they asked me if I would do it this year and I just didn't have the time but I've been thinking about it and I've kind of put together about a 15 minute routine and so I may I may do that uh, next year I'll, I'll, cool. I'll see and so uh, Facebook LinkedIn I'll make the announcements if that happens you can come and hear me I will put all your links in the show notes <laughs> we, we don't want to miss this <laughs> yeah but uh, but the speaking is fun it's uh, it's um, I I love storytelling I, the people I've learned the most from are storytellers. Yeah. Um, storytelling is a way of really remembering uh, and humanity, uh, humanity, our history is all based on storytelling. So true. You know, and, and uh, we talk about the, the Bible or the Torah, the, the Old Testament. And, and, and what are the, what do we remember? It's the stories in the, in, in Genesis and Exodus. What comes after that are laws and rules. And <laughs> we don't remember that stuff, but it's the stories. That's what, that's what we remember, you yeah. know, and, 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 uh, uh, that's what my keynote talks are. It's it's just it's an hour of storytelling and, and some humor and some jokes and uh, yeah, but you walk away with some real key points and oh, that good. you can take away that change that'll change your day. You'll you'll it won't it's not something you have to wait till Monday to implement. You can it'll change your day today and and it's fun and and I'm I'm having a lot of fun with it and that's great. Uh, um, uh, it's based on a blog that I've been writing for the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, I just uh, had my 78th blog with them published and wow. stuff. And so it's, um, yeah, it's that's prolific. Yeah. I, I, I didn't intend on that. They asked me, um, they put out a call for writers about seven or eight years ago. And, yeah. and, uh, and I said, sure, I'd love to, but, but don't ask me to write about clinical dentistry. I, I just want to tell stories. Yeah. And they said, Sounds great. And uh, <laughs> they call it the daily grind and it's all about what we do <laughs> and how we do it. And, yeah. and most of my stories have nothing necessarily to do with dentistry and everything to do with the people that yeah. come across our lives every day. And and uh, and from that blog, I've picked up uh, stories to create in my speaking career now. And, that's awesome. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. And so good. And that's that's what's driving me now. And in addition to all the other things that my scatter brain keeps me <laughs> going here and here and there. Uh, well, I'm going to put some guardrails up for you. What are the five things that people need to know? The five things that people need to know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I got it. I got it. So, this is a, a classic one is people don't care how much 
you know until they know how much you care. I hear that all the time in healthcare, and it's very true. But it's also in, in when it comes to business, people don't buy what you sell. They buy who you are. Right. Um, and a guy named Roger Levin uh, taught me that if you get to know eight to ten things about the person in front of you, um, if you get to know them, then your relationship with them will change from a professional one to a personal one. And if you can develop a personal relationship with that person, then your um, you will develop a bond of trust. And if they trust you, they will like you. And if they like you, they will accept what you recommend. Right. Because the more you know about the person in front of you, the more they think you know about what you're doing. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Makes sense. It, it, it totally makes sense. That's awesome. And, and, and it is. And so the other thing is you need to know what to say and not just say what you know. So you need to get to know the people in front of you so yeah. that you can customize what you're saying to them. Right. Because you can't, it, you can't have the can, same canned talk to everybody because sure. everyone's going to respond differently based on their own internal needs and wants and desires. So, you know, the golden rule, um, do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. Well, what if the person doesn't want what you want. Right. <laughs> so I prefer the diamond rule. Find out what people want and then find a way to give them what they truly desire. Wow. And that takes the need to get to know them. Nice. And there are simple techniques that you can learn. I use uh, uh, insights into communication. It's a, uh, you divide to, uh, personalities into, into f four types based on... Um, uh, Hippocrates' work uh, from 2,500 years ago, um, and, but it's uh, it's powerful. Uh, it's also based on the work of Carl Jung and and uh, and uh, another fellow whose name now escapes me, which I should know because I talk about him all the time. <laughs> but um, if you you know, there's a way of doing computerized testing, and that takes time. But if you get to know people. Um, and you know this system fairly well, and it, it just it takes an hour to teach it, uh, you can quickly assess the person in front of you and get to know what kind of personality they are. Right. And then you can customize how you talk to them hmm. because uh, it's uh, – and when you key into their desires and what drives them, they'll like you and they'll trust you and, and they'll work with you. And, That's good. And that changes your life. That's bang on. What a great – okay, that's one. <laughs> was that one or was that two? Well, I think that was probably all five. But <laughs> <laughs> no, that yeah. was really good. Yeah. That's, uh, that's outstanding. Um, so outside of business stuff, what's, what's, what's a thing that, um, I don't know what, what if, what's a, what's a word of wisdom or something you've given to your daughters? Like what, what's the one thing that you want them to carry with them? Well, um, you need to love yourself. You need to look in the mirror and like the person you see. You need to find a way to always pursue what drives you and not worry about what other people think. Cause it's not about what other people think. Yeah. Ultimately you've got to, you've got to like yourself and you got to like what you do and pursue the things that, that, that drive you, that make you happy. Um, we do too much we spend too much of our days doing things we don't enjoy doing and some things we have to do you got you know you got to do it yeah you you got to pay your dues you got to you got to do the work to to get to where you want to be um you've got to do what you need to do today so that you can do what you want to do tomorrow <laughs> um but if you don't love yourself, then you're not going to have love to give others. But you need to look after yourself. And so that means you've got to eat well. You've got to eat properly. You've got to, you got to exercise. You've got to get sunlight. You've got to, you've got to, um, you've got to sleep, uh, seven hours a night. Uh, um, there are benefits to routines and, yeah. and, uh, and, and that's not just for my daughters. That's for everybody, yeah. you know, uh, uh, and they 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 hear this from me all the time. <laughs> they're, they're tired of hearing me yeah, say the same thing over and over God. again. Yeah, but yeah. Well, there goes dad again. Uh, <laughs> but but it's it's true. And you do these things, you will have 
a happier life. It's not hard to to uh, to eat well. It's not hard to make sure you get seven hours of sleep. It's yeah. not hard to to get some sunlight every day. It's not hard to walk. Yeah. You know, you don't have to be a marathon runner or, or cycle 40 kilometers. Uh, you don't have to be this elite athlete to go for a walk. Yeah. You just got to go for a walk. Get outside, move your body. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. You're on a desert island. Yes. You have a book. Yes. You have a CD. Yes. You have a DVD. Yes. And you have your favorite food. Yes. What are they? Oh, my God. Well, first, I would be going crazy because I'm this eclectic guy (laughs) guy who doesn't want to listen to the same thing over and over again. But now you have to. So now I have to. So um, music, I would probably have Pat Metheny. As Falls, Wichita, So Falls, Wichita Falls. Okay. <laughs> I have ne- I've never heard it. Yeah. If I had to pick a second, it would be Elton John's uh, Yellow Brick Road. Fair. Um, if I had a book, oh, that would be hard. Um, I would probably go with uh, Frank Herbert's Dune. Oh, well, th- that's something that'll keep giving over and over and over yeah. again. Um, but, uh, there's so much that I like in that world. Um, uh, either that or, or, uh, or Anne McCaffrey and her, oh, uh, her, the her dragons, the, the dragon series is, oh, is I've, yeah. I've got chills. I yeah. haven't thought about Anne McCaffrey for years. And, yeah. And, and I'm trying to get my daughters into, into reading that cause it's so good. Yeah. I was introduced that to that, to her and that particular series when I, dragon flight is dragon flight. I think is the first one. And it's the dragon was chronicles is the yes. whole thing. Yeah. yeah the, the dragon riders of Pern. Yeah. And, oh, uh, so good. Yeah. There's, I'm like 14 books in that series yeah. now, but, but the first one, um, I also, uh, like, um, Terry Brooks's, uh, Shannara series is also okay. sort of Shannara is the first one. It's just outstanding. Um, uh, movie, uh, um, Blade Runner is probably my all time favorite, even yeah. though I'm a huge Star Trek, Star Wars, yeah. Babylon five fan. I'm a member of all three of those fan clubs, uh, been since the well i've been a fan club member of star trek since the 70s so i go way back but wow yeah so uh okay so uh, and then food and then food. We're gonna, then we're gonna come back to oh, peanut butter sandwich yeah i could eat a peanut butter sandwich every day crunchy or smooth uh both uh, really? but crunchy i'm a crunchy guy totally but, crunchy. but I'll, I'll eat i'll eat i'll eat it's just i'll eat it <laughs> it's peanut butter i'll have it yeah. that's awesome uh white bread brown bread multigrain um uh, i'm i'm um uh i'm not a white bread fan okay so so Other than anything could be, but could be, could be rye bread could be uh, oh, okay. pumpernickel could be uh, whole wheat it could be multigrain yeah I'm, gotcha i'm eclectic when it comes to bread all right um battlestar galactica battlestar galactica yeah you the, know the original and the reboot yes talk to me I watched the original, really liked it, and and had forgotten that it was really only one season. And yeah. then they came up with that second season, which we all like to forget about. <laughs> um, and then Battlestar Galactica, I watched the, it came out in the mid-2000s, about yeah. 2004. They came up with the miniseries, and I really did not like the miniseries. Mm-hmm. And then, so I didn't watch the series. Yeah. And now the series is on Amazon Prime. Yeah. And I just started watching it. I am about halfway through the second season. I'm going, holy cow, it's really good. Yeah. It <laughs> so, really is. So it's really good storytelling. And yeah. and it's it's you know, 15 years later, it's it's uh, the storytelling is is uh, standing up to the test of time. Yeah, I like it. And uh really enjoying it. It's um it's poignant. Yeah. No, it really is. And Starbuck. Oh, my gosh. Yes. She's yeah. something else. Well, Katie Sackhoff is, uh, there's a brand new TV series, that uh, science fiction series that she is, it's either going to be released soon or it's just being released. Uh, and she's uh, one of the lead characters, lead people mm. involved in making it, getting it produced. And, oh, and great. I'm, I'm going to have to check it out. Cool. So, I mean, you've got a, uh, you mentioned like the battles or pardon me, Babylon five, Star Trek, Star Wars. And of course I was going to ask you Star Wars or Star Trek, the quintessential question, but that gets thrown out the window because you're a fan of both. I'm a a fan of both, uh, Star Wars. It's the, it's the philosophy of of the Jedi and stuff, the storytelling, which I really like, but the science of Star Wars is all wrong. Star Trek (laughs) is, it's, 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 um, the science is correct as much as possible. And uh, 
Star Trek is at its best when they incorporate the humor to offset the seriousness of right. the storytelling. But um, I've always enjoyed Star Trek's ability to take common problems today mm-hmm. and incorporate it into their storytelling. Right and, from the uh, get-go. Right from the very yeah. beginning. And 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 uh, the most successful Trek stories are the ones that continue to tell um, modern issues today. And the most recent series, Picard, was exactly that. I haven't watched that yet. Oh, you... Find a way. Yeah. Find a way. It's I, so right on, oh, on the good. whole concept of artificial intelligence and rights of people and, and huh. uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Dude, don't say anything else. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, it's I'm just, go the, and it's watch just it. the concept of the storytelling. Yeah. It's powerful. Oh, that's and great. when you finish watching it, we have to talk. Okay. Uh, have you seen the new Blade Runner? Yes. And how really does that? I liked it. Okay. Yeah, I really liked I it. I haven't seen the new one yet. I, the original one had the music by Maurice Jarre. Yeah. And, uh, or was it Jean Michel Jarre? No, it was Maurice Jarre. And loved the music. You, there was, there, there was themes musically it was a character to it. In itself, and right? you could, you, you would remember the themes. The person who did the music for the sequel had the underlying moodiness of the music. But the themes were missing, and so oh. I didn't like the music in the second in the in the sequel. But I liked the movie. Okay, yeah, it answered lots of questions. It posed other ones. I thought it was really well done. What do you like the most about science fiction? Um, I like, I mean, being a science guy. Uh, uh, although I like science fiction, I like fantasy. I like romance. Um, I like history. Um, I like comedy, but I, I, but I keep coming back to science fiction. Like if I, if I, if that's my go-to, that's the one I seem to enjoy the most. Yeah. Um, it's just the, it's the storytelling that is otherworldly. Um, it, it, it fits my, my desires. I, I love the whole concept of outer space and in other places and in other worlds. Uh, that's why I've been a member of the Planetary Society, Society since it started in 1980 by Carl Sagan and wow. and, uh, and 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 others. I, I've now forgotten the names of the others involved, but the three founding members and and uh, it's a it's the largest publicly funded organization devoted to space exploration in the world. Wow! And I think uh, something like. Uh, Oh, I've now forgotten. There's several hundred thousand members worldwide, and and um, Canada is well represented in the membership there. And That's there's great. A, a large number here in Calgary who are members, and I've just been supporting it ever since, and forty years now. And wow. it's, they got a great podcast too for those who are interested. Um, the, the, it's called the Planet. Is what is it called? Planetary Radio. That's what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, I'll put that in the in the notes. Uh, at the end of every episode, I like to ask my guest, what advice they would have for the people I call the rebels in waiting. And these are the people that, I mean, let's be honest here. You have gone your own way from day one. Um, Not everybody does that. Lots of people get, you know, they, like you said, you, if you stayed in school, if you left school, you would never come back to school. So some people do that. They leave school and they just, they end up in this job. Um, And what I like to do with this show is inspire others or at least give them Maybe the thing that they need to hear. So what do you think these rebels in waiting need to hear to light a fire under their butt and take it to the next level? That's that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and, and uh, one that I know uh, tonight or tomorrow, I will have a better answer. <laughs> And and uh, we'll should I do that, sequel. I will uh, I'll send it to you so you can put it in the show notes if I come up with a better answer. You know, you meet people when they hear, you know, I, I could never get up in front of an audience. I would I would rather die than uh, than uh, than to speak publicly. And really, would you really rather die? I, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> oh, I, I'm going to tell another story before I come back to this. <laughs> Perfect. Samara, my youngest, we were uh, she's five years old. And, you know, you go somewhere and you have something and it's so good. You say, oh, it's so good. I would I could, I would die for it. Yeah. And she said, well, that's stupid. Why would you want to die? If you're going to die, you're, you're, you can't taste it. You should, you should want to live for it. Wow. And that has been our motto as a family ever since. So when we come across something that's great, we say, oh, that's to live for. Wow. So that's one of the mottos. When you come across something great 
It's to live for. It's not to die for. That's one takeaway. And the other one is to find people who will encourage you doing something you want to be doing. Whatever that is, just find a community of people, whether it's one person or multiple people who like the same things you like and find a way to spend time with them because that will make you feel better about yourself. And if you feel better about yourself, then you're going to go ahead and do more things that you enjoy because we only have one life to live. And if we, if you believe in reincarnation, we only remember one life at a time. So make the most of the time we have because it's all that we have is the time. Wow. The rest is just stuff. Outstanding. Dr. Larry Stanley, this has been an absolute pleasure. Well, thank you very much for having me here. I've uh, enjoyed it as well. You can find out more about every one of our guests in the show notes at therebelrebelpodcast.com. And don't forget to subscribe to The Rebel Rebel wherever you get your favorite podcasts. I'm your host, Michael Dargie. Thank you so much for listening. 